The Morning Majority on 630. WMAL. 707 on WMAL. Brian Nima, Tony Blankley in the house this morning. Coming up one hour from now, Michael Barone joins us. Larry Kudlow at 836 from CNBC. We've got Jake Tapper from ABC News a half hour from now. We'll talk with Jake at 736 as the president ends his trip in Europe. Steve Moore from the Wall Street Journal joins us this morning. Morning, Steve. Hi, good morning. Well, morning. Be- before we get into some money issues, I'm curious to get you your take, uh, your feeling. Mitch Daniels decided not to run. Donald Trump is out. Mike Huckabee's not going to run. Uh, who excites you who's in the field right now for the GOP? Well, you know, I've been on the road a lot lately, and, and I think <laughs> none of these candidates really excite the conservative base. It's really an amazing situation that, that you have... Uh, so many of the frontier candidates like uh, Mitch Daniels uh, pulling out. I think the one person who really excites the conservative base um, is Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. And I believe there's going to be a lot of pressure on Christie to get in this race. I think there's going to be a, a draft Chris Christie movement uh, because he, he appears to be the one guy who can beat Barack Obama in November of 2012. You know, there's been some speculation that the Obama camp is already preparing uh, to take on Chris Christie in in, in a general election. Um, what about the talk of uh, you know the governor of Texas, Rick Perry? There's also some people say you know uh, Paul Ryan could get into the mix as well. Yeah, I've heard uh, you're exactly right. I've heard Rick Perry, the Texas uh, governor, who's been a, a very effective and conservative and pro growth governor of Texas. Uh, you're right. Paul, there's some talk about Paul Ryan. I'm, I'm very good friends with Paul. He he keeps saying that he has young kids and he just doesn't feel like he's he's ready to run for president. But but then you you know there's some talk about uh, whether or not uh, Michelle Bachman will get in the race. There's there's talk about uh, possibly um, Mike Pence, the Indiana congressman, who said he's going to run for governor. But I could see him possibly switching too. So I guess the bottom line here is I really believe this field is going to get bigger. I think there is there is certainly room for new entrants because there's just not a lot of enthusiasm for the people who are in the race right now. From, from what you're seeing around the country, is there anything negative from a conservative point of view about Pawlenty? I mean, he seems to be solid in all, all those places, but you know, maybe I've missed something. You know, uh, Tony, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I, I know uh, Tim Pawlenty. I've known him for uh, years when he was governor of Minnesota. And, and by the way, being governor of Minnesota is a tough job yeah. if you're a Republican, obviously. Yeah. So he, he is... Uh, he is was an effective governor. He's not all that flashy and charismatic, and and I think that's one of the issues. Now, also, uh, Tony, uh, Tim Pawlenty was was a big Cap- advocate of cap and trade. Yeah, now yeah, that's uh, and, right. And now he's done his penance on that, mm. and so uh, we'll see whether people will forgive him for that. But I I got to give the guy a lot of credit. Credit, uh, Tony. You've been involved in these presidential uh, yeah. primaries and caucuses to go to Iowa and say I am not in favor of ethanol. Yeah. That takes a lot of courage, and and you know I. I give him a lot of points for that, and I'm going to give him a second look because most of these politicians, as you know, Tony, they go to Iowa and they just yeah. they, they suck up to the uh, corn. Well, it's, it's not only a, a, a courageous move; it's also a, a pretty shrewd one. I mean, he, he was launching, and he needed to do something that would get all of us jaded people's attention. And by golly, I think he did it. Yeah, I completely agree. It was a very shrewd political move to uh, to go. Look, I, I'm so sick of politicians. Uh, basically just kowtowing to voters and telling them what they want rather than telling them the truth, which is ethanol is a waste of money. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it, it's Palenti's Torpedo of Truth Tour, and it, uh, may, it may work for him, I, and we'll see how it goes. T- 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 tell me about the uh, cap, uh, cut cap and balance deal that's being talked about. You've written about that. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, this is, I think, going to be the big issue this summer about what we do on this debt ceiling. And Republicans have laid down a position which I think makes a lot of sense, which is to say we will not raise this debt ceiling. We're not going to do what Tim Geithner says is just give uh, give the president a you know uh, another two trillion dollar, right. three trillion dollar extension on his credit card limit unless we have some real. Uh, ironclad agreements from this White House that we're going to bring spending down. And I think this makes a lot of sense. As, as you know, 70% of the American people are against raising the debt ceiling for good reason. We've, we've got a $14.3 trillion national debt. We're borrowing a trillion and a half dollars a year. And so this is the idea we're going to have. We're only going to allow that debt ceiling to raise once we have these ironclad agreements that well, not only do we have spending caps, but the balance part is that within 10 years we have a balanced budget requirement that gets us to a 
balanced budget. But, I mean, I, I don't know the details in it. I know they want to stay, keep the outlays to about 18% of GDP, which That's is right. great. But is is it is it going to be the, the proposal going to actually have language that can be written into legislation? And, and what does it do with Medicare? <laughs> you know. That's a great point. Well, first of all, on the balanced budget issue, uh, you know, they they want to vote on the balanced budget amendment. Now, Tony, as you know, yeah. that requires a two-thirds yeah. majority, yeah. Uh, and and I don't know if they can get that, but at least they want insurances that they can get a vote in the House and Senate yeah, on that. That's just on symbolic, the, though. Right. Yeah. So the main thing is, though, going back to uh, the idea when we had the Graham Rudman, remember when we had that Graham I, Rudman rule that said if you didn't reach these deficit targets, there would be automatic, what we call sequesters, which are automatic cuts in spending to bring the spending levels down to the agreed to amount. I, I think that kind of uh, you know, guillotine on spending is absolutely critical if we're going to get these guys to ever uh, get spending under control. How, how does this relate to uh, Speaker Boehner's assertion or suggestion that he wanted at least as much in guaranteed yeah. cuts as uh, the president was asking for in new debt? Rights? Yeah, that will, Tony, that's definitely going to be part of any agreement. I, I don't, you know, you follow these guys more, even more closely than I do. But, you know, talking to especially the conservatives and the freshmen, they're not going to blink on this. I really don't believe they will. Unless they get a dollar of spending cuts for every dollar increase in the debt, I don't think they're going to vote for this debt ceiling. I, re- I really believe, especially after what happened on the continuing resolution, mm-hmm. where a lot of the conservatives feel they got rolled. Boy, I, ho- I hope you're right. I sure hope yeah. you're right. So everything's going to come down to the debt ceiling, and the, the 2012 budget is completely separate. It sounds like what you're saying, Steve. That's right. And the tw- this, I believe that Republicans... Um, have come to the conclusion, and I think they've come to the correct conclusion, that their ultimate um, point of budget leverage Mm -hmm. is this debt ceiling vote. And, you know, it's interesting because Tim Geithner is running around the country saying it's going to be Armageddon if we don't pass this debt ceiling. And the Republican position is, you know what, it's Armageddon if we do pass the debt ceiling, but we don't get some kind of spending cuts and we continue to borrow a trillion and a half dollars a year. You know, if we stay on the current baseline that we're on right now, uh, Brian, we will we will borrow ten trillion dollars over the next ten years, which is more money than the United States government borrowed from seventeen seventy six through two thousand five. Hmm. Maybe Guyton's statement was sort of like that religious prediction of, of the end of the world, <laughs> the rapture. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes those Armageddon predictions don't. Yeah, work it's out just, so well. maybe, maybe Guyton hasn't done his math properly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't happen on, what was it, May 21st? So yeah. It didn't happen on August 4th. All right. All right, Steve, good to talk to you. Always great to have you on the program. We appreciate your time as always. Great to be with you. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Steve Moore, uh, Wall Street.